We've had some great presentations this morning. Uh, I'd like to take some questions for either Dr. Hyder or Dr. Hennis uh, about the material that was presented. Uh, questions? Yeah, Dr. Hennis, Dr. Hyder, could you come up to the podium? Questions? So um, while you're thinking of your questions, uh, I'd like to uh, um, ask Dr. Hennis uh, for uh, some ideas about how he sees the, the use of data. What were the, the key success factors that helps data be used for, for, for policy and development? Yeah, well, I think clearly um, good data are what we're looking for. So I was very heartened by what my colleague said before in terms of the global program that he's doing. But I think um, really it has to be a strategic approach to filling gaps because without data, one can never have an evidence base where one needs to go. So I think any collaboration that gives you not just data, but good quality data is the way forward. And it moves um, from, um, I, I'm actually very impressed with what Hopkins is doing in terms of using, uh, using data for academic outputs, because quite often data ends up in a shelf or a drawer somewhere. But then that's just part of the issue. Next issue is moving data to policy, which is a bigger reach. And that actually requires that there's engagement of society. Because quite often, civil society or NGOs are the ones who actually hold um, governance or hold governments accountable for the utilization of data in the public health interest. So I think quite often, the, one of the key ingredients really is the role of NGOs and CSOs and other civil society organizations in terms of mobilizing the information into policy and practice. Because quite often, um, I, I don't wish to say this, but quite often those who should do it don't necessarily have to do it, but really ends up, they end up doing it in response to activism. Thank you, Dr. Hyder, any remarks too? Yeah, it, I want to add to that first to say that I think in the construction of the Global Road Safety Program of Bloomberg Philanthropies, the reason why different consortium partners were put together was really with a view to looking at a real world program that is implemented in real world settings and therefore is of value to governments and ministries. The idea was not that the donor, any, any external donor will never fund a government program for decades. Um, but hopefully that the lessons, uh, the examples, the opportunity, uh, the proof of principle uh, would be there and therefore uh, that would be carried forward. And that's why I think, uh, as Dr. Hennis has mentioned, one of the reasons why we were invited to participate is to help inform the consortium partners of what's going on, how are things changing, uh, what is the data saying? And I think it's only in the interaction between uh, uh, different partners with different strengths, when policymakers, strategists, transport people, uh, data people sit together, that you have uh, the opportunity for that exchange. And we saw that actually do uh, very nicely. In some cases, it worked a little bit less well in other places, but at least the process started of that engagement where research to policy begins to work with each other. And I think the more, the more opportunities there are, of that interface to happen, the higher the chance of, of data being absorbed. Okay, more questions. Yes, Kunli. Could you come to a microphone, Kunli? Or maybe and say who you're who you are for everybody else. There's a switch at the bottom. Flip it. Okay. Okay, it's working. Um, so my, I mean, it's a very interesting. It's interesting to. Hear. So my name is Konle Alonge. I'm actually faculty here at the school. I work mostly in injuries. Um, so my interest is really on how useful the data has been to the government and to NGOs working in those countries. You know, we hear about all of these fantastic work tracking outcomes and uh, behaviors, and uh, it's indeed important for us to be able to link the data to people who are able to um, use it, I mean, to change um, behaviors within their country. So how useful has it been, and then what's the plan to actually make sure that uh, country, um, NGOs within country have access to this data and to the information in this data and use it for their programming? Can I start? 
Thank you, Kunle. Uh, I think it's a critical question and one that we are now uh, actively uh, exploring and engaging in, which is um, a little bit of the sustainability question as well. Maybe I'll, I'll take it from the NGO perspective and request Dr. Hennis to talk from the public sector government perspective. Um, and other colleagues in the room, Dr. Eugenia is also here. Sorry, what? Nothing happened. <laughs> Sometimes it's good for us not to see things, yeah? Uh, it's incredible when we first started the project that the role of civil society in road safety was very questionable. In fact, in many low and middle income countries, there wasn't actually a single NGO working in the area of road safety. In the past five years, the landscape of civil society has actually changed. Now, as of three years ago, we have a, we have a global alliance. All right, and why don't you continue and, and hope it's over with. I'll continue and if they come back on again, uh, I think the announcement is failing. That's the first thing in this test. We've just realized the announcement doesn't work. Um, so I was responding to saying that when we started the, um, it was very difficult to find non-governmental organizations. Our colleagues at ASSERT, the Association for Safe International Road Travel, had a pretty tough time. Now, there is a global alliance of NGOs for road safety. I believe they have over 100 members. Many of those NGOs were working in either safety or child health or environmental health and are now moving into the area of road safety. I think one of the things this project, and then I must say this is particular about the donor as well, they've been extremely interested in promoting civil society engagement in road safety. Not only from the classic victims organization where somebody gets injured and their relatives create an NGO, but also from the prevention perspective and very importantly, promoting evidence-based interventions for civil society. Uh, many NGOs that did exist were actually doing things which many of us felt were not evidence-based, but rather things that make you feel good but don't necessarily reduce the rate of road traffic injury prevention. So I think the project has contributed in these countries. I'm sure through the course of this day, you may hear examples of that, um, but I think it's a very important issue. And I think without civil society engagement, uh, like any other area of public health, uh, clearly that's not going to work if we continue to do it from an academic perspective. But I'll ask Dr. Hennis to comment on the government. Yeah, I'm actually going to invite my colleague, um, Johan, to come and input here also. But what I will say is that the evidence that becomes available to us is used to inform our mandates and to inform our, um, our plans of actions and resolutions for the member states. So that is how we translate information into policy at the level of the region. Oh, oh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to mention the experience that we had in Brazil and Mexico, and it was very good. We promoted the participation of NGOs and to have special meetings for them. Uh, we organized, for instance, last August in Brasilia, a meeting on for all Brazilians and NGOs, and the idea is to strengthen this participation on these road traffic programs. And in Mexico, we had a very important role of NGOs to change this legislation that we mentioned in Guadalajara. We have one of uh, NGOs in that case was from a family victim, but it was a journalist that played an important role and to follow all our steps in the intervention in Mexico and help a lot in this change of legislation. And so we can chat more during the break if you need more information about that. Thank you, more, more questions. And remember to identify yourself for the, the listeners on the web. Margarita Nunez, Highway Engineer with the World Bank. I have uh, noticed lately in Latin America that the um, amount of uh, motorcycles are growing immensely, particularly mm -hmm. in uh, South America, and I would speak about uh, Paraguay and, for example, also Colombia. Mm. Mm, and, and I think this is a factor that we have to take into account more deeply in the why are these uh, motorcycles uh, uh, being promoted so widely? And the effect they are having in, in road safety, I see that uh, it's been taken into consideration. Also, the problem about the uh, texting. I also saw that about the, the different uh, um, reasons for the uh, traffic accidents, uh, one is distractions. And actually, these this, uh, mobile phones are uh, very, uh, uh, 
bad uh, influence in drivers. And we can see that in Maryland, they are doing a very heavy uh, campaign against uh, uh, texting and, and driving. And, and uh, I am talking about these elements because in um, Asia, this uh, uh, Vietnam and Cambodia that I understand you are working on, uh, they were also a very high level of problem. The two wheelers, the, uh, I mean the bicycles and the motorcycles, and uh, was particularly, is particularly important, the uh, use of helmets. There, another element is that we are talking about helmet being taken by the driver, but there are also the passengers, and sometimes people have the whole family in the bicycle, in the motorcycle, and only the driver has the helmet. So this is another element we need to concentrate a little more. Thank you. Other, we'll just to get a few more comments and, and questions before we turn it over to the panel. More comments or questions? If so, raise your hand. Uh, I'm Dave Etter from CDC. Uh, one thing you guys mentioned was the data collection, the different surveillance systems that are being uh, piloted or continuing. I think it would be helpful to talk about what kind of best practices we should be looking at, what are the resources that we should be consulting and encouraging our partners to use, and what kind of data collection we need to be doing uh, right now and in the future as we get these systems built and uh, keeping them sustainable. Thanks. Okay, one more uh, comment to add and we'll turn it over to the panel. I'm Shailaja from India. Uh, I had a question for Dr. Hennis. I'm wondering what uh, you meant by road safety being a social justice issue. And I, and I agree with you, but I'm just wondering what strategies PAHO had specifically to address that. Thank you. Okay, um, can you respond? Uh, let's just tr have our panelists uh, try to take that on. We've had three different um, uh, comments and questions. Dr. Hannes? Oh, okay. Okay, I, I you talk about the motorcycle in Latin America. And, uh, w that's one, as we show, that's a big challenge for us. And we, we are working with our country office and to address this problem. And for instance, taking two examples from the region, that's Paraguay and Dominican Republic. Uh, through our country office, we were working with the national authorities to raise our awareness about the problems and to try to improve campaigns. As you mentioned, we have a lot of problems that we have more drivers using helmets and we don't have passengers. And also we have sometimes the family as we have in some pictures from all other regions that we have motorcycle as a vehicle of the family. And in Paraguay, we have an intervention that we were working with the private sector. And through, they are training the employees that are the people that work on that, that um, industries and how to address this issue and how to take into account the risk and to use helmets. And we have more than 20 uh, private sector industries work with us in, in, in Paraguay to try to address this and to try to improve legislation also. Because in Dominican Republic, for instance, we don't have a legislation to, to have the uh, passengers with the helmets. The legislation just asks the helmet for the driver. So we are in very close relationship. We recently hired someone in our office in Dominican Republic exclusively for road safety they're trying to improve and so it's a big challenge you know, we little by little you are moving forward and the work with our collaborate centers is very important in the country because we are need more arms and more heads for this task it's not easy Thank you. Um, I want to make a few comments in response to, to these uh, three uh, questions. Um, first, the issue of motorcycle, I think, again, just to support what uh, Dr. Eugenia just mentioned, um, is critical. I think we need to also uh, get a better handle on the epidemiology of the problem. 
uh, understand the supply demand factors that you're referring to in particular, um, both in terms of the vehicle itself, which is the motorcycle, but also obviously the protective factors, which is helmet, uh, in terms of helmet legislation, helmet enforcement, helmet price. Um, and then there are some discussions around this concept of standardized versus non-standard helmets and the influx particularly, I'm not sure the situation in Latin America, but certainly in other parts of the developing world, the notion of non-standard helmet, what does that mean? And do they or do they not afford protection? Are they worse off or are they better off and so on? In a study that was done by the Road Traffic Injuries Research Network, uh, they were four to five times cheaper than the standard helmet. So things like that, and I think you're raising a plethora of, of questions there. I think the second point you've raised is obviously not only the driver but the passengers. And there's a lot of work I hope uh, later today you'll hear from colleagues uh, in Vietnam, for example, talking about uh, helmets for passengers, but also for children. And what are the success of, of this notion of helmet for children? How do you implement it? How do you make it happen? Um, which I think is critical. I think the issue around uh, data collection is a very, very important question. As, as you've asked, David, it's not a simple answer. Uh, it's a complex answer. Uh, later today, the session on monitoring and evaluation will talk about some of the lessons that the project has learned. Um, uh, Dr. Bachani and his colleagues uh, will talk a little bit about that. But I think it is critically important that at the conceptual level, this notion of doing evidence-based implementation of interventions is firmly grounded in ministries, in public sector, in the public-private partnerships that are occurring. Secondly, to have a system that is sustainable that can inform implementation. So clearly, if you have a uh, system which is extremely expensive, extremely complex, and nobody can run it, it's not going to work. And that might be okay for a research study, but that may not be okay for real-world implementation. So I think we still have uh, to clarify some of the lessons learned, and I hope over the next six months, at least from this project, we'll be working hard to put those and share with colleagues like you uh, to give feedback on those. And then finally, um, before my colleague responds on social justice, just to say that I think it's, it is a, a critical thing, both the, the determinants of road traffic injuries and the outcomes of road traffic injuries can be linked with socioeconomic status with vulnerability. And in some ways, I hope Dr. Hennes will expound on that and, and talk a little bit about that perspective. Yeah, it's a very important question in terms of social justice and inequity, because I think quite clearly, um, let's look at the most vulnerable groups those who are pedestrians, those who are motorcyclists, those who are bicyclists. And that again speaks to the fact that they probably don't have access to motor vehicles like cars. Also issues, for example, the neighbors who see people like to live, where sidewalks become an issue, traffic lights become an issue, policing becomes an issue, et cetera. So you're looking at a, a number of inequities that are not necessarily measurable or overtly measured in terms of how we do things. And therefore, <clears throat> therefore, in terms of equalizing and rebalancing and addressing the iniquities that have led to people being in those situations where they're vulnerable in the very first instance, underpins a lot of their risks. Hence, if one can then um, equalize or address the determinants, the things outside of the normal risk factors that we measure, this, and one can address them and correct them, this will make a tremendous difference in terms of reducing risk. Thank you. Um, we're, we're out of time, and I uh, wanted to just sort of summarize the, the key points that I think uh, we've, we've accomplished in the last 90 minutes. Um, we've heard that there's been a lot of progress in data collection and developing new tools and instruments in, in the RS10 um, uh, uh, research project. Uh, and we've set that in context where we've seen how the burden is, is, is coming up with tremendous inequality in who bears the burden, where the vulnerable road users are, are bearing a disproportionate share of the burden. And finally, um, uh, to summarize that, we, we are seeing a concept that uh, road safety is a matter of social justice because there are the haves and the have-nots. And uh, to frame it that way might be a great way going forward. Throughout all of this presentation, we've seen how because road safety um, uh, is a different problem, it has to be addressed with partnerships. We have to form new partnerships with civil society. This can't be a top-down, we are the experts, we are gonna make the policies and put them on you. It cannot work that way. So partnerships have been essential, will continue to be essential, and bringing the, the researchers' data with the activism of civil society 
is really the, the road forward. So one of the goals of the symposium is to form partnerships and network and collaborate. We have 30 minutes to practice that right now. So your assignment is to meet somebody new in the next 30 minutes. Um, there won't be any quiz, but you know what to do, go do it. I think we have refreshments throughout these doors and we'll expect you back uh, at uh, 11 o'clock for the next session. Thank you to our panelists and thank you to our uh, uh, audience.